Crikey. G'day. Brian's on to me. Well, my goal in life is to film every species of fish in the ocean, but more importantly, to share every one of those clips with anyone with an interest and an internet connection for free. For the last 14 years, my wife and I have led expeditions, apparently on holiday, uh, to take divers to the remotest places of the world. And the way to do that is to work on dive boats. Uh, Liz and I <clears throat> continue to charter these boats to take us to the very ends of the earth, beyond the remote villages of the world, where the last of the pristine and untouched virgin reefs uh, and other marine scapes can still be found, places where predators like this are still in really good, healthy numbers. From what I've seen, the difference between the way things are and the way they should be, based on how they are in populated areas compared to areas where there are just no people, and how I've seen my beloved backyard degrade over time, I've come to the conclusion that preserving marine biodiversity is the single greatest challenge of our time. And to that end, I believe that every species matters. The species checklist, the shootable ones, is my Bible. It's this epic three-volume tome by uh, Drs. Allen and Erdman, who are my heroes. They've captured every species that, that visit reefs or live on reefs in this amazing part of the world. You may not realize that pretty much all marine biodiversity evolved and, and still lives in this part of the world, the East Indies, Indo-Pacific. It's also called the Coral Triangle, but it could have also been called the Mangrove or Seagrass Triangle. Species, all critters have been spewing out of this species factory and dispersing on the ocean's currents generation by generation for millennia. And over time, barriers formed uh, and then opened again, and that allowed new species to evolve along the way, and they're recognisable but just slightly different from their ancestors. Diversity decreases in all directions away from that epicentre. And so down here in Noosa, beyond the Barrier Reef, we're too far south for a lot of tropical species, but plenty of them have made it this far. And the rest of them are still on their way down, riding the East Australia current, like Nemo's dad, um, probably pushed along by climate change, helping them get here maybe a little bit faster. Liz and I moved here in 2007, mostly because of Noosa's location immediately south of the Barrier Reef. Uh, we've done thousands of dives there offshore, and we continue to, but this is the first stretch of coast heading south where shore diving and estuary diving are a sensible thing to do all year round, crocodilically speaking. Um, <laughs> the Noosa River is a unique estuary, uh, and I thought that's the perfect place to find a lot of new species. Uh, both new to me and hopefully new to science. The amazing thing here is I'm a trailblazer. How the hell is it that I'm the only person diving in this magnificent place? Whatever the reason, people talk of bull sharks, I suspect that might have something to do with it, um, but after only 50 dives, I've documented 180 species of marine life, um, and most of them are first-time records for this area, understandably. But this is step one. This is the very first step in understanding our marine biodiversity and our ecosystems. This is all you guys stuck on the land. If you just jump off that land's edge, you will find an amazing variety of marine life right there. It's that close, throw a mask on, fall in, and you will see a collection of marine life working together to keep the oceans clean, keep the air breathable, and the fish bins full of fish. Of course, there's a lot of hard work to be done down there, so nat natural selection and old mother nature's been busy, come up with a complete freak show. And this, this is the wonder, this is the amazing thing and the, the joy of finding and filming these critters and then trying to figure out why and how this is fitting into our ecosystem, that's, that's the inspiration and the driving force that keeps Liz and us, uh, Liz and I, pumping out this kind of work. What the hell was that? <laughs> <clears throat> Didn't expect that at all. I've seen this before. Um, so anyway, you may have seen on this TED stage, or bigger TED stages, some of my heroes talking about their underwater explorations. Uh, Dr. Rick Pyle, for example, dives to the twilight depths, extreme. Um, Dr. Sylvia Earle, her deepness goes way beyond that to insane depths in submersibles and hard suits. But they spend squillions of dollars doing it, and it is much simpler and cheaper than that to be an underwater explorer. You may be surprised to know there are amazing unexplored frontiers literally on our doorstep. 
there's nobody diving in the rock pools or in these little creeks that we walk over every day, which means nobody is filming it, nobody's photographing it, nobody's studying and understanding these areas. Lots of opportunities. Think GoPro on a stick. You could become a describer of a new species and an expert in no time at all. Lots of nods, good. Take the GoPro off your board, stick it on the bottom. What's going on underneath you? You might not like to know, but you might. <laughs> and the good thing about this, video being this new and wonderful way to capture biodiversity, is it's non-fatal. The traditional methods, quite often, we end up with a record of what used to live there. If we use poisons, nets, electrofishing. With video, we can, anyone can shoot it for a start, anyone can review it later, and most importantly, we can record far more detail about what the critters are doing. This, this is how we normally do it as, as a marine biologist. You're down there with a slate. This is on clear, shallow water, obviously, where we can see. Uh, a lot of times we can't see. In the Noosa River, at the moment, it looks like poo soup, quite frankly. So underwater visibility is a massive restriction. But on those magic days where good, clear weather for a long time and calm weather for a long time and small tides all come together, and it's not a weekend and it's not a school holiday, then on those magic days, you and I can jump in there, take photos, take video, and start understanding some of this um, amazing marine life. You will find when you jump in there, if you do, that it's quite a different world. Um, there's no air, it's the first thing. There's also no gravity. Um, a puff of breeze will knock you over. There's deadly things buzzing overhead. Those are boats, by the way, and not the other thing you were thinking of. Um, so in all this confusion, it's easy to miss things. Important details, subtle behaviour, uh, entire species at times. And I know I've learned a lot more about divers and marine life at home, behind my computer, during those incredibly tedious, countless hours of cataloguing 36,000 video clips. I learned a lot more there than I did in the 2,000 hours underwater filming them. So I'll show you some of the things that I've learned <coughs> and a few general principles about marine life that you should be aware of that you may not. Um, mimicry is one of my favourite interactions. And this happens on land too, but it's better underwater. Everything's better underwater. Um, it involves usually an adult of an aggressive or poisonous species. So in this case, the poison fang blennies at the top. And the mimics are usually harmless, often just juveniles of something that will change into something else as it grows older. Uh, think of sheep in wolf's clothing is the mimics. So how this actually plays out, here are five fairly unimportant, um, to you, not to me, species um, that are very widespread. The first one, Cook's cardinal fish, Osterhynchus cookie. This is a small fish, the most boring and ignored fish on the planet, most likely. Uh, comes out at night to feed on plankton. Then we have three small or mid-sized snappers, Lutjanus snappers. The first one, Lutjanus fulvi flammer, the black spot snapper, very common here in the Noosa River. Then moving offshore, we have two other Lutjanus species, Lutjanus lutjanus, the big eye snapper. There will be a quiz at the end, by the way. And the yellow banded snapper, also known as Hussa, Lutjanus adetii. Now this is a more localized species whose stronghold is actually right here off our coast, out on the reefs. So these three species are all very tasty, which means they are commercially trawled, recreationally fished, and they grow to about 50 centimetres. Finally, we have the painted sweet lips, Diagramma pictum, also known as the slaty brim, for obvious reasons. Tastes awful, which is why it's called the mother-in-law fish. Um, <laughs> I didn't name it, by the way. The question is, what do these five fish have in common? And I know you're all busting to know. And here it is. You're all thinking, that's a Moses perch. And you're right. More widely, it's known as a Russell snapper, because in the uh, snapper family, Lugenus russelli. Today, I'm going to call him Russell. Russell, this is actually at the end of Russell Street, which is a coincidence for you, at the end of the DPI jetty. Um, but Russell, every fisherman recognizes Russell as an adult. But nobody I've met recognizes him as a juvenile. All fish change color as they age. And for this species, natural selection has decided that from transparent larvae, your best first step is brown stripes. Why the hell would that be? Well, probably because of a fang blenny, actually, but also Cook's cardinal fish here. It's a similar fish, similar size, I should say, in body shape, and very common in the estuaries where baby Russell likes to live, like our river. Maybe it helps Russell avoid predators. Maybe he gets a few extra bits of prey as a result. It doesn't really matter what the advantage is, it'd be hard to figure out. What matters is it works better if Cook's cardinal fish at the top there is present, 
and it only works until you grow to that maximum size of this little fish that you're growing to. The next step, when you outgrow that, you need a new set of pyjamas, and the brown stripes turn into yellow stripes, and this big, big black spot appears. Why on earth would that be, you ask? Anyone interested? Yeah, well, probably because of this little bloke, Lutjanus fulvi flammer, the black spot snapper, which is the common small snapper in our estuaries. So as a large juvenile, Russell hangs out with the black spots, again, to avoid predators or score some extra prey. You all keeping up? Excellent, gets better. So then they <clears throat> move offshore to our coral reefs just off the coast, where they mix in with banded, uh, yellow banded snapper and big eye snapper. To mix in with these guys is one at the top there. Obviously, the black spot is of no use at all, so that fades away. And only the yellow on the pectoral fins and the anal and ventrals, because obviously they're helpful in blending with these yellow striped species. Okay, once they outgrow these guys, so we're talking now they're up to about this size, they'll move to even deeper water where they lose all their colour to blend in with this lady brim, the mother-in-law fish. These aren't fully mature yet, and you'll see them move in a second, and our mate Russell moving in to <laughs> join the school. Okay, <clears throat> so in case you're wondering why the painted sweet lip, which is obviously more of a slaty, shouldn't be called a brim, um, mother-in-law fish if you eat it, why painted? Well, that's also because of its uh, early stages of life. So as you can see here, we have five stages that this painted sweet lip is going to go through before he becomes that boring old slaty brim. So the first step, we're going to mimic poisonous catfish. Does a pretty good job, I think you'd agree. Then we're going to mimic, again, a flat, um, sorry, a fang blenny. It's the same one as before, but this guy has outgrown his fang blenny, so he's going through this awkward teenage spotty phase. <laughs> But that's not enough spots. Here, that's more like it. Lots of little yellow spots. And why is that? Well, to blend in with the locally very popular yellow spotted sweet lips, Plectorhynchus flavomaculatus. And of course, now you're all wondering, well, surely Plectorhynchus flavomaculatus doesn't start with yellow spots. And you'd be right, it is a yellow striped juvenile to blend in again with cardinal fish, in this case, the Sydney cardinal fish. And again, this is the most common cardinal fish in our beloved Noosa River. So we're back to where we started. Hope you followed all of that, because I'm just about spent with it. But back to Russell, who those other five species are completely out of their food chain. They're not predators, prey, so we don't know about them. But those, those five species may be the reason that Russell I, or Russell, lives or dies. Who should know? How can we be monitoring our fisheries, important species like Russell, if we don't even know all the interactions that he goes through in his life? And how can we know them if we don't even know what species we have in our river, that you guys won't jump in and have a look at. So that's our first step, and I don't even particularly care what the dead fish in a jar can tell us. How, what's the dorsal spines? How many lateral line scales does he have? It doesn't matter. What matters is the presence or unexpected absence of every single species and the interactions between them and how they are making our ecosystems function or not. I'd like to share with you now my favourite fish. This is Labroides dimidiatus, the blue streak cleaner ass. And the cleaning refers to parasites. We're getting rid of parasites here. And in this case, gill parasites. You can see the batfish is opening the gills to allow this delicate procedure to go on. Why? Because if you don't get rid of parasites early, they become unsightly. And it upsets your love life. Imagine this guy. Hey, baby, you want to go spawn? <laughs> nah, not really. So these horrible parasites have led to the cleaning industry. And cleaning shrimp have developed some sort of protection racket with moray eels. And way back when, some sort of ledger was signed that it, all fish agreed, you can come and clean. Oh, open mouth, no worries. Yeah, we won't eat you. Trust us. So it happens. And then, somewhere along the line, the cleaner fish arrived, and Labroides, our hero, enters the scene, eating a 1,000 parasites a day. Pretty good. But that's not why this is the most important fish in the world, in my world. Actually, everyone's world. This little fish attracts every other fish to, the, to one point on the reef. To sit still, to come out of their hiding, to come out of the blue, whatever, sit still at this one spot, smile for the camera, and have a little poo. <laughs> or collectively, a huge poo. And a fish toilet is actually the best possible place to live for marine life. Obviously, we've experimented with sewerage from humans, and that does not work, but a cleaning station like this, stand out on the reef because they're the pinpricks 
of the reef that are left where megafauna like mantas come in from out of the blue and all the food they're catching out there, they bring it all back to this one point source to have that poo. And when a whole pile of things do it together, they create the entire food cycle right there on that spot. Lots of studies have shown us that corals do much better, are resilient to climate change, survive bleaching when they've got fish pooing on them. These things only eat poo, surgeon fish, shrimp, worms. Imagine how good their poo is, poo poo. <laughs> the important thing here is that all those tasty snappers we saw earlier, and you and I don't want to eat poo. And so if we want to eat those tasty snappers, we need to maintain the entire food chain to get that poo, sorry, that nutrient from poo through coral or seagrass into an invertebrate, a small fish, a big fish, into something that's going to go well on our plate. So every species in that link matters, and I, for one, look forward to learning what they all are. But there are a lot of them, so if you want to help a brother out, um, this is a call out to underwater explorers everywhere. Just grab a camera, turn the selfie stick around, put it underwater and help me capture marine biodiversity. I guarantee you, if you can hold the camera steady, get it close to your subjects and be patient, you will shoot species no one's ever seen before and behaviour no one's ever seen. Once you figure out that species, make sure you let the rest of us know why that species matters. Thank you.